17, verse Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to begin in verse number 28. First Samuel 17, we'll begin in verse number 28 in just a moment. We do want to welcome everybody to our Sunday morning Bible class, and uh, there are a lot of announcements that we need to go over, so uh, if you have not grabbed a bulletin, make sure to grab a bullet between worship and Bible class. I think most of us are aware, but the the price uh, the prices the the Brendas are doing better. Brenda Price is uh, doing better, and Brenda Talbert is also progressing. So we're glad of that. The doctors are working, I think, to get her uh, blood sugar regulated, and uh, hopefully, when they get all of that done, she'll she'll be doing a whole lot better. So uh, Brenda Price, Brenda Talbert. Both of them are improving. Also, Kathy Garrett's great-grandchildren have recovered from the RSV, and they're doing well. And then uh, Kathy mentioned, I think it was Wednesday night, that one of her cousin's sons, uh, his name was Ryan Yates, was involved in a motorcycle accident. He is in stable condition. Apparently, uh, he broke his neck. They got that fixed. I think the... It seems like that's going to be okay, but he is in stable condition. He did have some blood clots that they're having to deal with. So uh, remember Ryan Yates in your prayers. And also on July the 5th, uh, Marva's going in for a heart ablation. So we need to remember Marva in our prayers. And of course, the good news that we received last week uh, that Mary Adams' granddaughter Erin was baptized into Christ. So we're excited about that. Those are the ones that we have on our sick list. Is there anyone else we need to mention this morning? All right. If not, let's go over the announcements that we need to talk about. The first thing, when you look down at the bottom of your bulletin, the upcoming events, uh, next Sunday, Terry and I will be gone. We'll be heading down to Camp Ida on Friday to prepare for our session that we host at Camp Ida, and that is uh, the third through the 8th, so that is Sunday through Friday. I think you're aware that Terry and I get down there on Friday, get the kitchen cleaned up, and start preparing, buying the food for the session, and so that's, uh, if you've never done something like that, this year we're going to be a little bit smaller in numbers, so that makes it a little less uh, of a job, but when you get, a, if you cook three meals for 120 people a day, that's a lot of food that you, you have to buy and prepare. So anyway, Terry and I will be heading down on Friday to get ready for Camp Ida. Also have a request along those lines. If y'all have any craft supplies that you just got stashed back and you're not using it, and you want to get rid of it or get some space, if you could bring those supplies, we can use them for our crafts at Camp Ida. They do like, uh, beads and bracelets and all kinds of things. So if you've got crafts uh, that you're not using, craft items you're not using, and you would like to uh, donate those to camp, if you can have them here Wednesday, uh, then that would be great. Wednesday night, if you can have it here Wednesday night for Bible class, then we'll load all that up and take it down to Camp Island on Friday. Uh, but uh, Frida is the one that's uh, taking care of our crafts at Camp Ida this year, so uh, you can also talk to Frida about that. But uh, we're getting excited right now. We've got about 36 campers signed up uh, to go to Camp Ida, which uh, I think y'all are aware that's a little bit less than what we normally run. But uh, you remember we were closed for two sessions for COVID, and so our session has kind of, and then we were also, uh, we had a lot of Arkansas people that were part of our group. And uh, Arkansas, one group has started their own session. So our session got slashed about in half. So uh, we've still got a bunch from Arkansas that come to our session. We get them from Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Uh, we get them from those three states that come to our session. But we lost about half of our Arkansas session. Uh, which uh, is fine by me because we were getting too big. I mean, we weren't having room. We were having to use the cook's cabins for, and so uh, I'm not uh, upset that uh, we divided like that. It wasn't anything 
you know, no doctrinal or anything like that. It was just we were growing too large, and so we divided our session. Uh, that means now there are seven sessions at Camp Ida. Uh, they're hosting seven weeks of camp. Uh, when I started at Camp Ida in the 90s, uh, it was one session. <laughs> we had one week, and we had all the kids that came. Of course, we would be full, but it was one week. And now it's gone to seven weeks. And so we're excited about the camp and the growth of the camp. Uh, but anyway, back to that, if you've got any crafts, we would appreciate it. And as I mentioned on Wednesday night, I believe uh, Brother Johnny Estep is going to be here Sunday filling in for me. So in the Bible class, he's going to talk about the work that they're doing in the Philippines. You remember right before he left in January to go back to the Philippines, he gave a report, but he said there's been a lot of new stuff happening, so he's going to give a report about the work in the Philippines during the Bible class, and then he'll preach Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. So y'all make a, a special effort to be here for Brother Johnny Eastep and uh, support him as he's going to be filling in for me. And then, of course, our summer series starts the first Wednesday night in July. That is July the 6th. And Brother uh, Ed Stover, who is the preacher at Chandler, uh, the Church of Christ in Chandler, is going to be here uh, kicking off that summer series. And I was asked a moment ago, are there going to be classes for the kids in the back? And no, we keep everybody out in the auditorium. So everybody will be out in the auditorium. So that's Ed Stover on the 6th. Brother John McCormack will be here on the 13th. And then Brother Ken Hope will be here on the 20th. And then Brother Russ Tracy will close it out on the 27th. So that's our updates on the summer series. Of course, there's also going to be a baby shower for Tad and Abby Morton on the 16th. So y'all mark your calendar for that. Then we have potluck today. There's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we got potluck today and y'all know the routine. We have our uh, Sunday morning worship and then we go together, we eat together, and then we come back at 12.30 and have a shorter afternoon service and then we're dismissed for the day. So that's the plans for today. Yeah, we're going to have a review of the men's business meeting after the uh, the uh, afternoon service. So the 12.30 service, when it's over, we'll have a review of the men's business meeting. And it should be pretty short. And so uh, just stay for a few moments if you can. Anything else? Well, let's talk about something that happened this week in our nation. <laughs> I know that y'all may have seen this on the news, but uh, in case you didn't, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. And this is something that we've been praying for uh, for almost 50 years now. It's 49 years that that uh, has been a scourge of the United States of America that we slaughter our babies. And I, and I say this, and I'm not trying to be overly stating the case we slaughter our children on the altar of convenience mm -hmm. and that's what it boils down to for every 99,000 abortions that are done a thousand of those maybe deal with a, a a situation where the mother's having a problem and they're trying to save the life of the mother and the child and so we we understand we want to fight for the life of both of them and sometimes one of them dies, and we're sad by that. But 99% of the abortions that are done right now in America are done for convenience sake. Mm -hmm. I'm on the track for a job. Uh, you know, I don't feel like I can support this. Job. Whatever the reasoning behind that is, that's where it stands. And we also understand that... Uh, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we realize that abortion is no greater than any other sin. And people can be forgiven of that. Mm -hmm. And while we rejoice that the Supreme Court made in this 
instance, I believe, a right decision. Uh, and by the way, they didn't do that based on the sanctity of life or anything like that. They just said that it needs to be decided on a state level. That, that's what this, it doesn't ban abortion, no matter what you're seeing on the news. It doesn't ban abortion in all 50 states, the United States of America, and all our territories. All they said was this decision needs to be done by officials that are elected to represent the people of their place, their state, and they can make whatever laws they want about abortion. Well, you know what that means. There are going to be some states that are going to have abortion. It doesn't matter when. And then there are going to be other states like Texas that say, no, you don't get abortions. You don't do them unless it's an emergency. And, and they can shout all day long that there are no exceptions in the law. And there are when it comes to the emergency, uh, the saving of life. And so uh, anyway, we rejoice. But I also want to add this word of warning. We don't want to make this where we stand up and pound our chest and, and shout hallelujah and talk ugly to people about their position on abortion. I've seen way too much of that already on Facebook from our own brethren that are, that are acting, in my estimation, in an ungodly fashion and ridiculing people that don't agree with them, calling them idiots. How many times have you seen that word being thrown around? Well, they're just a bunch of idiots if they believe. Brethren, that's not the way we talk about people, and that's not the way we treat people. We treat them with love and respect. We follow the pattern of Jesus. And I realize that Jesus was blunt and stern on some occasions. And we can do that, but we better be very careful to make sure we know what we're talking about when we do. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Jesus, when you read Matthew 23, that severe rebuke was to the religious leaders in the way that they had misrepresented the word of God. You think about that. We have leaders in our nation that are misrepresenting the word of God. Yes, we can we can confront them and we can be blunt with them, but we're not rude and ugly. So I, I have to say that because I've seen too much ugliness among people that claim to be religious, that are that are calling people that don't agree, well, you're just an idiot. No, that's not the way we talk. So anyway, any other thing before we yes sir. Heard an interesting statistic this morning on Fox News that was talking about abortion. All three of the hosts remember growing up and seeing a number of Down syndrome children in their classes. Yes. They said that doesn't happen anymore. Ninety percent of those children are aborted. Okay. Is that correct? Ninety yeah. percent. Yeah. And and I don't know and I don't know where they got that statistic. Uh, uh, so. I'm not doubting that statistic, I but, uh, well, I still see some, so, I mean, but I, I don't think there were any kids in my class that had Down syndrome. I don't remember seeing any, but, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know, and uh, it's just, it's sad that we would say that a child like that doesn't deserve to live. That's sad. 90%. All right. Anything else? All right, let's continue our look at the reign of Saul. And, of course, we're looking now where uh, David is going to kill Goliath. And you remember that uh, uh, Goliath had come out for 40 days, and he was challenging the children of Israel, the men of the army, to come out and fight against him. And if, if you defeat me, he said, then we'll be your servants. But if I defeat you, then you are going to be our servants. And of course, where was Saul during all of this? Hiding in his tent. He, he's, uh, he's shown himself to be a poor leader. He's shown himself to be a coward when it comes to actually leading the armies of God. And you remember back from 1 Samuel chapter 8, we mentioned this last week, one of the reasons the children of Israel wanted a king was that he could lead us into battle. And so uh, that, of course, is not going to take place with a man like Saul. Now, David is going to step up, and he's going to be a warrior king, and we'll read a little bit more 
uh, about that in a few moments. But at this point in verse number 28, when David gets there, his father said, you need to go check on your brothers. This, this is going on, uh, how they're doing. And you take them food and provisions and you take provisions for their uh, leaders. And so when David got there and he saw Goliath challenge the children of Israel, he said, who is this man that is defying the armies of God? That's verse 26. And of course, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why comest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Uh, talk about sarcastic, ugly remarks. And of course, if you've got older siblings, you know how that goes sometimes, right? So he says, you've got the little old few sheep that you're taking care of, so who did you leave them with? He said, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might see uh, the battle. And David said, what have I now done? What have I done? Is there not a cause? And of course, we spent a lot of time last week exploring this idea that there are a lot of causes in the United States of America. As a matter of fact, if you remember, one of the ones we talked about last week was abortion. And I, I even said, we don't know when that decision is coming, but the Supreme Court is talking about it. I had no idea that they were going to do it this past week, and I don't think they let that out. I think it was a shock uh, to just about everybody that they had uh, just made that decision. And so we're talking about spiritual warfare. We're not talking about physical warfare. We're talking about spiritual warfare. And there are a lot of causes that we need to stand for. We need to stand up for the truth. And so verse number 30, he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former matter. Verse 31, when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul and of course Saul sins for him. In verse 32, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Uh, what do you see in David in verse 32? You see confidence? Well, I'm going to fight this giant. I, I, I'm not afraid to fight this giant. How could David as a young man most likely still a teenager, how could David have that kind of confidence? His faith. His faith. He had a faith that was strong and powerful, and his faith was in God and not in himself, right? It was in God. God is the one that provides. And so David trusted God, even as a young man. And brethren, we do, in my estimation, a great disservice when we talk about uh, young people being the future of the church and not recognize they can be a powerful part of the church right now when they're young. They can be like David. They can have that kind of confidence. I, I'm, I'm saddened that we're not raising up young men and young ladies that have that. I want y'all to keep your finger here, but turn to 1 John. And y'all know this, we've talked about this text many times. But let's look in the book of 1 John. And I want you to notice that in 1 John uh, chapter, let me get here. Okay, uh, I don't see it. I was thinking it was chapter 3, but it, yeah, chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We want to notice a verse from 1 John chapter 3, and then we'll go to 1 John uh, chapter 4. 1 John chapter 3, and then we'll look at 1 John chapter 4. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 7. Listen to what John writes. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he, that is God, is righteous. So, brethren, we can be the righteous people of God, and we don't have to be afraid. Now go to 1 John 4 and verse 4. A verse, like I said, we all know. It says in 1 John 4 and verse 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who are the them that he's talking about, by the way? 
Worldly folk. Okay, worldly folk. Go to chapter one. I mean, excuse me, chapter four and verse number one. He says, "Don't believe every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Why? Because many false prophets are going out into the world. So there are a lot of false prophets, John said, that have gone out into the world. But you have overcome them. You have overcome." these false teachers because you understand that greater is the one that is in you than the one that is the, in those of the world. Brethren, we can have confidence. We can stand boldly and proclaim that we are the children of God. And we do this not in a spirit of arrogance, but we do this because we trust God. He is in us. And he's greater than the one that is in the world. That's where David drew his confidence. And that's the point. So we go back to verse 32 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. He says, look, don't be afraid. That's what it means if your heart fails. Your heart fails. He says, don't be afraid. Don't let your heart fail because I will go out and I will fight against the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go up against him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So what is Saul's response? David, you can't do that. You're just a snot-headed kid. And yet you're talking about going out to battle against a man who has been tried and tested in battle over and over again. You cannot defeat him. What is that attitude that we see in Saul? A lack of faith. It is a defeatist attitude. Well, you can't win because you haven't fought like Goliath has fought. And so verse 34, David responds to Saul, Thy servant kept his, kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. Verse 35, I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this, un, excuse me, this unsized circum Philistine, unsized, uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he has defied the armies of the living God. So what is David's response? I've had experience. I am a tested fighter. I have gone in. I've taken a, lie, a lamb that was stolen by a lion, and I grabbed that rascal by his beard, and I slew him. I took it right out of his mouth. I took the lamb from the bear. So don't tell me I don't know anything about fighting because I have been tested in battle. By the way, that is <laughs> that's a pretty good resume, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know many people today that would go in with just a slingshot and beard a lion in his den. Do you? I don't know many guys do it with a shotgun. <laughs> you know, I don't know many people that have that kind of bravery. Well, I think Lynn nailed it with that. David didn't, or excuse me, Saul didn't have that resume. Now, Saul had fought battles, but I, I wonder how. <laughs> I, I wonder I wonder exactly how those battles went. Uh, he wasn't willing to do what God said about slaying the Amalekites, and he let King Agag go. He didn't kill him, even though God specifically said, the man has a death sentence on him. And it needs to be carried out. And Saul was unwilling to do that. So I don't know what kind of resume he had, but it doesn't seem like it's like David's. And so he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is defying the armies of the living God? Verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine and Saul said, Go, and the Lord be with thee. He will deliver me. Was there any doubt in David's mind? Mm -hmm. 
don't see a, I don't see any doubt. And of course, we're reminded of 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of sound mind and a love. God has not given us the spirit of fear. And brethren, we cannot adopt that spirit of fear in our lives. We simply cannot afford to do that. And so then Saul said to David, let's go and I'll stand right beside and fight that rascal. Is that what he said? <laughs> no, you go on. You go on and the Lord be with you. Uh, I think we see cowardice still in Saul. He's not even willing to go with David. And so verse number 38, Saul armed David. That's put his armor on. And he put on a helmet of brass upon his head. He also armed him with a coat of mail. David girded his sword upon his armor and he had saved to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. So what does he say in verse 39 when he puts on Saul's arm? I don't need it, and I haven't tested these. It's like somebody going out to hunt, and you, you think about this, and the weapon that they take with them, they've never fired. And they don't know if it'll fire or if it won't fire. Remember the uh, show, uh, man, the, the name of it slipped in my mind, about the, the ghost in the darkness? Was that the name of the, about the two lions in Africa? Uh, that that Y'all never heard of the ghost in the darkness? <laughs> well, if you've got Ben Angel, you ought to watch the ghost in the darkness. I say if you've got Ben Angel, it's got, uh, it's got a lot of swearing in it. But uh, it's based on a true story about two lions out of Africa that became man killers. And they killed over 100 people before they actually uh, were uh, killed. Uh, and so it's based on a true story. As a matter of fact, in the Field Museum in Chicago, they actually have those lions that they stuffed. And uh, if you ever get a chance, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome to go see them. When we lived in Illinois, we went up and saw them those two lines, and they're pretty large lines, but then when you start reading about them, they actually had to make them smaller because some of the skin had got eaten by moths and stuff, so they had to trim it down. So so the ones that you see in the museum are not the size of the lines that they actually were. Uh, but anyway, they called them the ghosts in the darkness. They were man killers, but in that movie, one of the men that is hunting, when he's about to go out, one of the guys says, well, here, take my gun. It's it's more powerful. And I don't know if this part is true or not. You know how Hollywood kind of sometimes stretches just a little bit. Not much, but just a little bit. But anyway, he didn't, he, he didn't and never fired the weapon. And when the lion got ready to attack, uh, he pulls the trigger and it goes click. <laughs> Nothing happens. And so, uh, and then he was chided because he had never tested the gun before he went out to hunt that lion. So, uh, David is saying, look, I haven't tested these. I don't know if, they, if they're suitable for me as a warrior or not. I, I've got to test them. So he took them off. What do you see in that? That's more faith in God than he does in a man's equipment. Okay, that's where, I, that's where exactly where I want to go. We can put on the armor of other men. But that's not the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6. And brethren, uh, and I'm thankful that this congregation is not like this, but I don't know how many congregations of God's people that you go and you visit and you're going to say, well, Brother Guy in Woods said this, and Brother Thomas P. Warren said this, and Brother So-and-So said this. That's fine. And those men may have well spoken the truth. But if you can't back it up with Bible, and I'm not being disrespectful, if you can't back it up with Bible, I really don't care what Brother Guy in Woods said about it. And I don't care what Brother Thomas B. Warren said about it. And I loved those men. I knew Brother Warren. I never met Brother Woods. But I highly respected uh, Brother Thomas B. Warren. But he was a man. Mm -hmm. And he could be wrong. And you know this. That's why we put every man's word to the test. Are they speaking the Bible or are they speaking of them all, their own selves? 
And so when you look at this, David was not willing to trust in the armor of a man. He trusted in the armor of God. And that's really the point that I want to draw from that. Don't start putting on somebody else's armor when you go out to battle. And don't, don't take books that were written by brethren. And, and you, you understand what I'm saying. You need to know. You need to know what you're going to say. And you need to have your Bible with you. Can we use that literature? Yes. And we can use it to the glory of God. But if we don't know what the book says, we don't have any business handing out some man's word. And that's really the point. So he says, he took them all, first number 40, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in a strip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So uh, he chooses five smooth stones. And I want you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 21. And brethren, this is, and I talked about it last week, so a little bit of a repeat. I don't know what David had in mind when he picked up those five smooth stones. But the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 21, beginning in verse number 15, moreover the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistine. And David waxed faint. What does that mean? He got exhausted. He was exhausted in the battle. And Ishabiah uh, was one of the sons of the giant. Of the giant. Uh, the weight of his spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weighed. He being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abisha the son of Zeria, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. So what happens in this scenario? David is battling a giant and he's exhausted and it looks like the giant is about to win, right? But you have one of the servants of David who steps in and kills this giant, right? So then notice what happens. Verse 17, latter part. The men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt not, thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. So what did they say? David, you need to quit going out there and fight. You might get killed. We need you as the light of Israel. And we don't want you to be on the front line every time there is a battle. So what kind of warrior was David? He, I'm sorry, a leader, and he was not afraid, and, and he is not like Saul hiding in his tent. But you know that is it Ecclesiastes 9 11 or 7 11, where it says that time and chance happen to everybody. Let's turn over there, Ecclesiastes. And uh, I think it's 9 11. But I don't remember precisely. That's it. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11. Solomon writes, I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift. What does that mean? The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. Why? <laughs> if something happens, he might be a little bit tired. Might be having a little bit of a bug. He might stumble out of the blocks. And he might turn around and look back. There are a lot of things that happen. That's one of the reasons that we know that Charles Darwin theory of the survival of the fittest doesn't even stand on the surface. Because the fittest don't always survive. They might something happen completely unforeseen to the fittest, right? Mm -hmm. that, that largest animal might get a thorn and get an infection and then die from that. So the survival of the fittest is just a 
supposed narrative that Charles Darwin put down, it had been around for a long time before Darwin wrote it down, but he put it in kind of a logical idea, and he said, well, the, the survival of the fittest, the fittest survives. By the way, they were saying us folks wearing glasses, we're just draining the, the, the uh, pool, and so we're making people weaker because our eyes are not strong. You know, we're not like Moses when he was 120 years old. His eyesight is not dimmed and his strength is not abated. We're not, and so we're hurting the gene pool, according to Darwin. That's what he would say. The survival of the fittest is fault. The swift, the race is not always to them. Now notice this, nor the battle to the strong. David was a great warrior, but David got tired. And on equal footing, we would say David would win that battle 10 times out of 10 with the giant because God's on his side. But we've got to take into account, David was not at his optimum. And this giant is about to kill him. And so he goes on to say, Neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. Watch this. But time and chance happeneth to, the, to uh, them all. Time and chance. We sometimes refer to that as luck. And I understand that we need to be careful using the word luck. But time and chance is the definition of luck. It may very well be that it was an unlucky day <laughs> for David. Time and chance happen to be just precisely aligned, and David almost is killed by this giant. If it had been for his servants, we're back to 2 Samuel 21. If it had not been for a bison, David might well have died. And so he steps in and kills the giant, and they say, look, David, you need to quit going out to fight and have a battle. We don't want your light to be extinguished. Verse 18, it came to pass after this, that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Shabakah, the Hushabite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, and Elkanah, the son of, and boy, these names, I love them, Jehoram, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose uh, spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a, another battle in Gath, verse 20, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he was also born to the giant. Don't know, but they have uncovered skeletons with men with six fingers and six toes. I happen to know a couple of people that on one foot they have six toes. They've got one that uh, grew out and they've got six toes, and one of them's my niece. So I know this is true. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it with my own eyes. There are people that sometimes have six toes. These men, I don't know what going on, but it seems it ran in the family that they were large men and they had six hands or six fingers on their hand and six toes. I, I don't know all the details of that, but when he defied Israel, verse number 21, Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David, slew him. Jonathan, the son of David, the brother of, or the son of Shemaiah, the brother of David slew him. Verse 22, there were four born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Goliath is already dead, and it seems to me, and this is one of those things that we were, were kind of, because the wording is a little bit ambiguous, it seems like there were five of those brothers that were giants. Four of them were still alive after David killed Goliath. And now those four brothers have been slain in 2 Samuel chapter 21. And so that puts an end to at least that lineage of the giants. But we go back to 1 Samuel 17 and verse 40. And preachers speculation. And preachers sometimes like to speculate, right? <laughs> Why didn't he get five stones? I don't know. 
but he may have been loading up every, every barrel in case those brothers showed up. That's just my throwing that out there for you to chew on. Uh, but he put five smooth stones out of the brook, and he put them in his shepherd bags. Verse 41, when the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. What does it mean, he disdained him? He made fun of him. He made fun of him. He, he's, what is this little whooper snapper here? Look at, look, look at it. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? Remember, he had a, the shepherd's stave, the shepherd's a staff in his hand when he picked up those five stones. So he still got that staff with him. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Verse 44, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air, to the beasts of the field. And David said unto the Philistine, Verse 45, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. I'm not coming under my own power. Coming with the power of God. We've got to put on the whole armor of God today. He said, you haven't just defied men, you have defied the armies of God. By the way, that name, uh, the Lord of hosts, is that Jehovah, uh, where he is the, the captain of a mass of, of uh, warriors, we would call them angelic beings that are at his disposal. And so God is the God of hosts, the God of the armies. Verse 46, David said, This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thy head from thee, and I will give thy carcass to the host of the Philistines this day, and to the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth. Why? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David repeatedly gives the glory to God. You haven't just defied me and you've defied God and the armies of God. God will give me the victory. You will die this day. I will cut off your head and your body will be left in the field to the beast of the earth and then everybody will know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. The battle belongs to God. Isn't that a beautiful song when we sing it? The battle belongs to the Lord. And it came to pass, verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone, and he slang it, and he smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. When you hit somebody hard enough that they fall face down, you know you've done some damage. You hit somebody, usually they fall backwards, but if you ever watched when Somebody gets hit and they kind of just fall down face first. You know you've done some damage when they do that. He has smote him in the head. He ran to me. And it says, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistine saw the champion was dead, their champion was dead, what did they do? They ran away, they fled, and the men of Israel of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines till they came to the valley to the gates of Ephron, and the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way Shearam, Shearam, unto Gath, and unto Ephron, and the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines. They spoiled their tents, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. So he took his head with him, but he left his armor, that would be the armor of Goliath in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of those, Abner, whose son is this youth? And he said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son this strapling is. I want to pause there. I thought David 
had that he already knew who David was. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I mean, he knew David. So what is happening in this verse where he says, who is this young man? <laughs> Why is he confused? Let's read a little bit further. David returned to the slaughter of the Philistines, verse 57, and Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hands. And Saul said unto him, Whose, art thou, whose son art thou, thou young man? He answered, I am the son of of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. So we're going to have to pause there. So you've got homework for two weeks. <laughs> why does Saul not recognize David? What, why is there confusion? Because he's already met him. He already knows him. Remember David is playing the harp because he's having these uh, uh, evil spirits that come up and David plays for him. So why is there no recognition on Saul. So that's your homework. 